Hello, good morning, and this is Taib at Taibs.com, and uh, welcome back to our study of the book of Hebrews. We're going to start chapter 3 today, and then we're just going to zero in on verses 1 through 6. Now, chapter 3 subheading is uh, Jesus is greater than Moses. Now, for people like me and you, we don't really have like a knowledge of the Old uh, Testament like the, a good uh, Jewish person. Those words may not mean too much. Now, we know Moses and we know how Moses uh, led the people of Israel through the wilderness. We kind of know about the stories, but we don't understand the weight that are carries. Like Moses is uh, probably the most respected, if not one of the most respected uh, figures in the Old Testament because the law was delivered to Moses by the angels. So for the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 3, for the author to say that Jesus is greater than Moses is a heavy, heavy thing. Now with that said, um, I want to kind of give you a quick uh, synopsis of what we looked at uh, last week and then we're going to get into uh, looking at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. Now we ended uh, chapter 2 and looked at the reasons why uh, the author is telling us not to neglect the salvation the salvation Jesus has uh, wrought for mankind. And we specifically looked at the importance of Jesus taking on the human nature in order to be the perfect and adequate representative for humanity. In that he came to not only atone for our sins, but also to uh, live the perfect life that God desires. He was not only faithful uh, as a high priest to God, but he also was merciful to God, merciful to mankind, I'm sorry, merciful to mankind because he understands the human experience because he became one. He became one and, and chapter two chapter two ends with, um, for he himself was tempted when, um, when suffered, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, Jesus was tempted but he was sinless. He did not sin. He did not give in to temptation. So because he took on a human nature, he understands the human experience. And he is the perfect sacrifice for mankind because he atoned for our sins and he also lived the perfect life that God desires. So now chapter 3 is going to start with um, a series of verses. And I just want to zero in on verses 1 through 6 uh, this morning. So let's go and I'm going to read it. And then once I read it, uh, we are going to uh, analyze them one verse at a time. Now listen to the scripture. You can look on the screen. He says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built but by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as his son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Now this is the word of God, and I'll invite you to pay attention to it. Now we are going to look at these verses one at a time. So in verse 1 we are told, Therefore, holy brothers, you will share in a heavenly calling. Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. What is he telling us here? Again, the writer is saying to us, in light of everything that I've been saying to you since the beginning, and we looked at some of these things, like uh, Jesus is greater than the prophets and angels. Jesus atoned for the sins, and because of his work, God has glorified his, his humanity by bestowing on the humanity the name that is above every name. That's the name Son. And he's now seated at the right hand of God and waiting till all his enemies are put under his feet. And he isn't ashamed to call humans his brothers. And he became one so that he could be a faithful and merciful high priest 
in the service of God. And he's not oblivious to on the suffering of man because he was made like humans in every respect and can identify with the infirmities of humans without being without sin. He is sinless, but he can identify with our sufferings. Okay? And his sacrifice on the cross was pleasing to God and the resurrection authenticated that. So because of all these reasons, and more particularly, because Jesus understands the human experience, the writer is telling, is about to declare some very important truths to us and to his readers, okay? And we need to know what they are. And we need to know who those people are. He calls them, he says, holy brothers, okay? He refers to the ones that he is writing to as holy brothers. And why is he using that appellation specifically? Because those are the followers of Christ who have been set apart by God. Holy brothers, they've been set apart by God. He's saying, in light of everything that I've told you, my brothers who are holy, who have been set apart by God, they are the ones that we share in the heavenly calling. Okay, he's saying, you will share in that heavenly calling. We share in that heavenly calling. Those people that uh, the writer was writing to, they share in the heavenly calling. And ultimately us, we also share in the heavenly calling. So he's telling them, listen, to consider attentively and to fix their eyes on Jesus and to fix our eyes on Jesus. And he defines Jesus as God's chief messenger and his priest of what they and we confess. Okay. And then that, um, I, I want to kind of explain that a little bit. The apostle and high priest of our confession. And, and the confession is that which we believe and that which we've put our trust in. We've put our trust in Jesus' works on the cross. We've put our, our, our trust in that and that's what we, we talk about. We preach the gospel, the good news that he came to atone for the sins of the world. So we've put our hope on Christ and Christ alone. So, so the writer is saying, therefore, you whom God has set apart, because God himself is the one that initiated the call. And you share in this heavenly call and the call of God. Now, he's telling us and he's telling the readers at the time to fix their eyes on Jesus. Okay? The apostle and high priest of our confession. The messenger of God. And if you look at John 3 verse 17 to 34. John 5 verse, verse 36 to 38. Verse 36 and 38. John 6 verse 29 and 57, it shows that Jesus was sent by God. And I want to look at some of these verses before we go any further. We're going to look at John 3, 17. Listen to John 3, 17. The scripture says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The world, those people of the world that God himself has chosen. And in verse 34, we read, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. And then we're going to look at John 5, verse um, 30, John 5, verse uh, 36 and 38. Listen to the scripture. John 5, verse 36 and 38. The scripture says, uh, But the testimony that I have is greater than than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I'm doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And verse 38, and you do not have his word abiding in you. He's addressing the Pharisees, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. And then we're also going to look at John 6, uh, 29. Listen to what the scripture says here. John 6, verse 29. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then we're going to finish that with John 6 verse 57. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so would, would whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Now you can see that Jesus again was sent by God. He is the apostle and high priest of that which we confess. And the verses I just read to you give more weight to the declaration that we read in verse 1. And that leads me to the second verse. Now, he's saying, consider Jesus. And then he goes on to say, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. 
Okay, this is now the writer had just told his readers to consider very carefully Jesus. He said, fix your eyes on Jesus, really pay attention to Jesus. And then he begins with a light comparison between Moses and Jesus. And we already talked about how Moses is revered in the Jewish religion. Moses was really seen as probably one of the top figures in the Old Testament because he represents the law. So now he's going to give us more reason why um, we should fix our eyes on Jesus and ultimately us because he's primarily addressing the readers and, and, and we are the readers now. So um, this is why I keep saying us. Now, Jesus was as faithful as Moses was in all God's house. Now, God's house is pretty much uh, the people of God. The house of God is the people of God. So the author is basically comparing Jesus' ministry to Moses' ministry. And because the Jews, again, held Moses in the highest esteem. Well, he's going to show later that Jesus is greater than Moses. He, ma he made mention of it in general in chapter 1 when he said that back then uh, the prophet, God used the prophet as his mouthpiece, but now he has spoken, spoken to us through his son. So he, he, he made a general statement. Now he's being specific and he uses Moses because Moses, like I said, is, is seen as the top one of the top three Old Testament figures. So he's going to compare Jesus to Moses to, to make a point there. So, but how faithful was Moses? To, to understand that, let's read Numbers 12 because it pretty much summarizes how uh, God himself honored Moses. We're going to read Numbers 12, verse 1 to 9. Now, this is what happened. Miriam and Aaron, they opposed Moses. Now, Miriam is Moses' sister and Aaron is his brother. Now, listen to what they did. Now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. So Moses had an Ethiopian wife and they kind of criticized him for it. Now listen again. Miriam, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had married a Cushite woman. Repeated twice. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoke only through Moses? Has he not spoken to us also? And the Lord heard it. God was not pleased. Now the man Moses was very meek. You see the word? Moses was very meek. More than all people who were on the face of the earth. Now did you hear that? Moses exuded meekness. More than everyone that was on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles and he beholds the form of the lord why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant moses and the anger of the lord was kindled against them and he departed now we read later god disciplines aaron and miriam now you see that the passage shows us the kind of honor moses received from god you see god says when I speak to prophets, I use riddles and dreams and stuff like that, but not with Moses. With Moses, I speak mouth to mouth. Okay, so Moses received that kind of relationship with God because the scripture says he was meek more than all the men on, on the face of the earth. So, and he beheld the form of God. This is how much Moses was honored by God himself. But the thing is this, Jesus doesn't just behold the form of God. Jesus is God incarnate. Now you see the weight that this carries if we neglect such a great uh, salvation. Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not just another figure that is important in the Old Testament. Jesus is God in the flesh. God, the God man. Okay? And the writer is going to expand on that in verse um, 3. We're going to read. Listen to what he says in verse 3. For Jesus, he gives the reason why. Because Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than 
Moses. This is why we should consider Jesus as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Why should you consider Jesus? Why should we consider Jesus? Because he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses in the sense that the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. See, Moses was part of the house of God. He was a man of God, but not sinless. Moses was not sinless. Okay? He was commissioned by God and faithful in his ministry, but he didn't die for the sins of the world. He couldn't atone for the sins of the world. He just couldn't do that. He couldn't fulfill that. And as a matter of fact, Moses himself was commissioned by Jesus, as we see in Exodus 3, the burning bush. The scripture says, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. Now, whenever we read in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, this is uh, a theophany or a Christophany where Jesus appears, the pre-incarnate Jesus appears. So he commissions Moses himself. So Moses was part of the house, but Jesus is the builder of the house, as we, we will see in verse 4. And we, we established that Jesus Christ is the radiance of, of the glory of God. That's in chapter 1. In other words, God himself, hence greater than Moses. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Okay, so he is far greater than Moses. This is why we should consider him. He's given us reasons after reasons after reasons. And that leads me to verse 4. Listen to what he says. For every house is built by someone but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Now we established that Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. In other words, God himself, hence greater than Moses. So if Moses was faithful as a servant and he came to be a messenger of the things that were to come, his job was to point to the coming Messiah. Okay, that's what Moses' job was, is to point to the coming Messiah. So, and, 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 and Jesus is not just uh, a man, like we saw. He said that he is not, he's truly God and truly man. So, Jesus is the builder of all things. We see that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. For all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That was John 1. But in Colossians, we also read that he is before all things, because all things were made by him and for him. Okay? So he is the builder of all things. Now Moses is faithful as a man in the house. He's part of the house of God. And among God's people, he is faithful. But Jesus is God who built that house. He built that house. That's the difference. So Jesus has more glory than Moses because Moses is a servant. Jesus is the son. And we're going to read that in, in verse 6. Listen, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. See, Jesus is faithful as a son, not a servant. He's the firstborn of all creation, one with God in essence, and he has infinitely greater glory than the angels and Moses himself. And the author finishes his verse by saying that those who hold fast and hang on to the teachings he is handing to them are considered part of the house of God as long as they hold on to the hope he is preaching to them. Now, He's not suggesting that we are the ones in charge of our salvation. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying that holding on to these truths that he's speaking is an evidence that we were truly called by God and were given new birth. Those who remain faithful are the, are the ones that truly belong to the house. Those are the ones that God has called. So he's saying, he's not saying that you are in charge of your salvation. He's saying, by you holding on to those truths, you are proving that God has truly chosen you. And John, 2 John, we read the same thing. If you go to 2 John chapter 1, verse uh, 9 and 10, listen to what he says here. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever 
abide in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So John is pretty much saying the same thing the book of Hebrews is saying in chapter 3, verse 6. Verse 6, and the scripture says, But Christ is faithful, is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So if you hold on to this truth, if you hold on to what we've heard, if you hold on to the end, we prove by that that we were called by God indeed. So again, Jesus is far greater than Moses. This is why we should keep our eyes on him. We should consider him because he has done far greater things than Moses because Moses came to serve Jesus, to point to the coming Messiah. So Jesus has greater glory and we've seen what he achieved for mankind, his death on the cross, his life that he lived and now seated at the right hand of God until all his enemies are put under his feet and then we shall reign with him and he understands the human experience to me this is the greatest thing because oftentimes i don't think i understand the gravity of him truly understanding the human experience so we can go to him because he, ad he can identify with our suffering he can identify with the things that we go through because he went through it all. He hungered, he was tired, he was exhausted, he was betrayed, and and then he understands the human experience. So we should consider him. He truly understanding and he's able to help. Unlike the others, they didn't die for our sins. They can identify, but they are also just as sinful as we are. Jesus was sinless, so he can give us victory over the things of life. And I want to internalize these things because that helps me to go to him because when you face the greatest trials, what does Peter tell us? He say, uh, um, cast all your burdens upon him for he cares for you because he understands truly what you are going through. He understands because he was also a man like us in every respect, the scripture says. So we should go to him and not being afraid in the sense that we should have reverence for God, but not fear in the sense of being dreadful. Well, if you're living a sinful life, then yes, be dread, <laughs> dread yes, because you're going to be disciplined and we're going to see that uh, in verses 7 and, and the rest of the, the in chapter 3. All right? But today, I just wanted to focus on the greatness of Jesus over Moses himself. So have a wonderful day, and I'll see you uh, next time. Thank you.